Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long interview program where we invite a guest host to interview the author of a new book. This week, Frederick Hitz, former Inspector General of the CIA, presents his thoughts on the current state of American espionage in his book, Why Spy? Espionage in an Age of Uncertainty. Mr. Hitz remarks on the issues facing spy operations amid the war on terror and discusses the release of the Justice Department memos on interrogation techniques. Frederick Hitz discusses his book with Peter Ernest, former CIA operations officer and currently executive director of the International Spy Museum. Fred Hitz, it's very good to see you today. Good to see you, Peter. <clears throat> Fred, we, we are here to talk about your book, Why Spy? But look at the extraordinary time that we're meeting in to talk about this book. Here we are, we're fighting two wars. We're, we're looking at pulling out of Iraq, or at least bringing our forces down, beefing them up in Afghanistan. We're looking at the Taliban on the move in Pakistan. We're looking at one of the most extraordinary financial crises the country has ever faced. And as we sit here, the Department of Justice has just released several memos written during the previous administration setting out guidelines for what was called enhanced interrogation, which included waterboarding. And this is causing quite a bit of a reaction by the American public, by the various parties, by all sorts of other entities. As it should. All those things touch on national security. And in some way, you allude to most of them in your book. As, as, we, as we go back in the book, one of the things that struck me was you took the time to say, look, during the Cold War, in which those who were involved in human, particularly the CIA, the FBI, distinguished themselves by recruiting people on the other side. And you go over what you call the seven classic motives. Let me ask you, if we look at that experience and that ex expertise that was developed by our intelligence people, is that going to be up to the challenge we face today? Well, that's the fundamental question, Peter, and you honed right in on it. Let's just for a second define what we're talking about. I have always gone with the definition that Kim Philby used in his disingenuous autobiography written in the late 60s from a cold uh, Moscow landscape. It's uh, the collection of secret information from foreign nations by illegal means. And it's simple, but it makes the point. It's not something that in this extraordinary time of internet connections, uh, blogs, uh, every uh, nation, need, collection of nations having a TV or something outfit outlet that we're interested in. We're interested in stealing secrets. And that makes the question you put that much harder. There are the seven motivations that I deal with in my book, but in the clearest sense, we know perfectly well that if Islamist terrorism is what we're worried about, we're not going to be meeting people who will have access to that group at an embassy cocktail party. This is going to be a much tougher kind of assignment where you're going to be out there in the bazaars, on the ground, probably spending a fair amount of time uh, just getting settled. And there you're going to have to be able to speak difficult languages. I noticed the CIA, for instance, has sort of a signing bonus a la professional football. You can get $35,000 if you can speak one of six languages. Dari, Pashto, Arabic, obviously, uh, uh, Chinese, Russian, but uh, we don't have that many people that are good at that yet. And in fact, the clandestine services announced not very long ago that they had only 28 percent people of uh, people on board who uh, spoke a foreign language, not necessarily one of those six hard ones. So we've got a ways to go. We also have to go a ways, Peter, it seems to me, to understand the cultures we'll be operating in. And that's just something that time on the ground and, and obviously preparation will give us. This is not all about the United States anymore. This is really digging into the 
interstices of, of uh, some quite complex uh, cultural situations. We have touched on several things that, that uh, you do highlight in the book. One, of course, is where are we going to meet them? Uh, they're not on the dip circuit. They're, they're not uh, working in the press corps and so forth. And, and that's is what you touch on as access. What is going to be our access? You and people like who look like you and I are not going to be working the bazaars. We're not going to be working the... We're not. The, yeah. Absolutely not. And I don't know if you noticed that uh, in the Times a couple of days ago, a, uh, a, a Muslim American, uh, an FBI counterterrorist officer, wrote a terrific yes. piece about uh, just that. How do you interact with Muslims? How do you un uh, interact with uh, potential Arab terrorists? And of course, his, uh, his point was that you get more flies with sugar than vinegar. You've got to get the confidence up. There has to be respect. So we're going to have to learn that. Well, Fred, you, you initially joined the agency in 1967 as an operations officer, or case officer, as they're called. And you had experience in the agency, really, from that period up until when you left in 98, after you'd been the inspector general for some eight years. You recall, as I certainly do, that even up against our principal target, which was the Soviet Union and its, its allies, its satellites, we didn't have lots and lots of Russian speakers and lots and lots of, of Hungarian and Czech. We had some. We had a sprinkling. And almost all of those were people who had acquired it as first generation, uh, the, the, the daughters, sons and daughters of first generation families in this country. But there were only a few, even at the end. And some got it through military service. They'd gone to Monterey or something of that kind and gotten uh, instruction. But you're right, Peter, and I remember, and I'm afraid you do too, uh, days when, we won't name names, but, but uh, people working in the Near Eastern world say, would, would turn to you and say, I know the only language they need to know. Yes. So you get, yes. you, 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 it, it, it was America's position after World War II, where we had all the industry uh, operating that was in the, uh, in the world, we had uh, all the money, we had all of the infrastructure, we had the power, and we were the go-to guys. We were the people who, if you didn't want to be swallowed up by the Soviet Union, you would want to have on your side. And that's not the situation that obtains today, as we know. We're, we're multipolar, and we, we've got to work with others. You make, you make a very important point in here, and I know I've heard you say this before. This whole confrontation uh, with Islamic fundamentalism and with some of the other issues we're facing, this is not just an intelligence issue or a law enforcement issue. And if, if the country is not galvanized as it was, let's say, after Sputnik, when the Soviets put up a, a satellite, um, where will we get the resources? You, you have a, a couple of startling examples here. You talk about the Baghdad embassy in, in I think it was 2006. Out of a thousand person complement, six had any command of an Arabic, of Arabic uh, language. And that comes right out of the Iraq study group. That was just exactly what Messrs. Baker and Hamilton reported as a consequence of their, their uh, researches. You make another point, you talk about, and I think it's 2003, 2003, 2004, where you say that the number of students in this country studying Arabic and Arabic studies was in the order of six. A year later, it was 22. In other words, unless there's some national effort to develop expertise, to develop people both like what we used to call language and areas study, uh, the, the agencies with the, with the incentives and so forth are not going to be able to do it on their own. I agree, and I think the point being that, uh, frankly, uh, uh, th this is so central to our success that we're going to have to do it in the way we did uh, some things after Sputnik with the National Defense Education Act, which is still on the book.